Now, I said earlier on that there are no easy choices or decisions in this. Uh, somebody who's perhaps faced with some of the most difficult choices of all uh, is Phil Wallace, the uh, Minister for Local Government and uh, Community Cohesion, and I'm very pleased to welcome him here to outline government's response to my report. Phil. Well, Sir Michael, thank you ever so much indeed for that uh, run-through of your uh, report. Um, the uh, three initials that keep cropping up in my intray are SML. I have uh, SBL, Sandy Bruce Lockhart, in the morning and SML in the afternoon. Um, uh, Ed was kind enough to uh, say on behalf of the government that the response was up to me. <laughs> and then... As they might say in the West Wing, Ed has left the building. <laughs> so I can say what I want now, can't I? Um, one of the things I learned as a young man, as a negotiator, Sir Michael, was that the best proposals in a negotiation were to ask for everything that he could give you and nothing that he can't. And you should be congratulated, Michael, on the thoroughness of your report on the forensic nature of it, the comprehensive nature of it, and the fact that you have passed that test. You have done, and your team, local government, an enormous service. Not just because you've produced such a forensic well-thought-through report, but that you have displayed your skill at providing options to elected politicians that they can go for, and arguments to help them to do that. And I thank you very much for that. You have done three other very important things. You have reminded us that if local government is to be the place shaper, that we all of us are striving to ensure that it is, that the expenditure side of the equation is as important as the income side of the equation. I spend many hours researching into the decisions that my predecessors have taken. Uh, I read the Layfield report uh, closely uh, quite recently again, and I have to say, Sir Michael, that it occurs to me that however good reports are, it is the time and the context in which they report. And we have a great advantage over Sir Frank and his colleagues in that we can move forward in this uh, area. I also read the diaries of the local government minister in the mid-1950s, Harold Macmillan, and I noted in his diaries that when it came to uh, Harold being the Prime Minister, and I have no pretensions that, that, uh, whatsoever, <laughs> nor as the Deputy, just to be clear, <laughs> the first decision that the Cabinet took, according to Sir Harold Macmillan's diaries, when he took over the Premiership of this country, was to postpone the revaluation of domestic rates. In 1957, it was the first item on the Cabinet agenda. And they, this issue has, of course, bedeviled. But what you have done, Sir Michael, is you've reminded us that expenditure is an equal part of the equation because unless the public are convinced that they get value for money from their expenditure, then no amount of changes to the balance of funding and the flexibilities will carry public consent. The dialogue between local government and central government cannot be based on a continuous plea for more resources. If local government is a genuine partner in the governance of this country, then it cannot be based on that relationship which it has been on many occasions in the past. The new burdens policy is, as Sir Michael says, a huge obligation, correctly so, on government. But we must always address the fact that devolutionary measures are exactly that and carry with them net benefits as well as net costs. And so we have to have that transparency, as you refer to correct. Thirdly, you bust some myths, particularly your analysis of the financial relationship between the tax base and the council is an important lesson to learn. And the debate, as you rightly say, in your introduction, as well as in the opening chapter, is different than that which was the case when you started your report, that government did move the goalposts 
and widen the goalpost quite significantly. But fourthly, and most importantly, these recommendations about place shaping are crucially important. They were there in your interim report and they're there now. The idea that the local authority, as the democratically elected leadership of the place, should have responsibility and power over other public expenditure in the area is one that we accept. Your clear analysis of the paradox between devolution on the one hand and minimum standards and the postcode lottery on the other hand and how we can square that circle as a country is spot on and it is that policy through local area agreements through local development frameworks and through sustainable communities plans by which we will square that circle. So I thank you for those things. Now, you've given us, Sir Michael, a, a, a list of uh, the government responses and that, that's very helpful. I'll just fine tune uh, a few of them. Um, the, um, <laughs> thank you for that. I'm glad somebody's listening. Um, before I do that, it's important to place on the record that the depth and breadth of the consultation that you've undertaken and that is outlined in the report is impressive indeed. Seminars, conferences, surveys, public opinion, of course, has been central to it. And you should be congratulated for the model of consultation that you've given for us. Um, it is, as I say, a substantial and, author and authoritative uh, analysis, and we uh, welcome the report and I'll outline now uh, in more detail uh, what uh, our response to this report is. Um, the report calls for action by central and local government alike and it's important that we recognise that. This is not just a report of recommendations to central government, although no doubt it's central government that the national media will most pay attention to, but you know as practitioners that the recommendations to local government are important as well. In particular, you identify the large number of national targets and directions set by central government departments for local government as limiting local government's accountability to citizens and limiting its ability to work creatively, flexibly and with innovation. We agree. The strong direction set by central government over the past 10 years, uh, which has come through the comprehensive performance assessment and other measures, together with the substantial investment that there has been both capital and revenue in local councils, along with the hard work of council uh, officers and elected members, has dramatically improved local government's performance. That is the case, not my findings just, but that of the independent auditors. Councils have responded and given good progress to those uh, pressures. And we are already therefore committed to a massive reduction in the number of performance indicators and targets. And I put on record my thanks to the Local Government Association in particular for the work that they have done in a, and in our ability jointly to build up a political uh, consensus across local government, the like of which I think Sir Frank Layfield would have given his right arm uh, for, and we should pay tribute to the LGA uh, in that. In addition, we will set out clear goals for reducing the number of specific grants and ring fence grants. No government will ever abolish completely ring fence grants. Parliament wouldn't allow that, even if government were minded to. But I do give my commitment uh, that that is our policy, and I think I can uh, back up that policy with real example. We're already, as you know, uh, looking at the way in which we can tackle the complex and burdensome data reporting requirements, and we await Michael Freitas' task force with interest. We appointed a local authority chief executive uh, again for that work. Now, the greater clarity on what central and local government agree to do together for local people is a core to the report. It's a key theme also of the white paper and I thank you Sir Michael for your recognition of the white paper and your welcoming of it. We see the white paper and this report as being parallel processes out of which has already come the local government bill which is before Parliament and 
out of which has come the white paper implementation document. We are moving to a new era of local area agreements or local spending plans to give them a more uh, colloquial title. These are individually negotiated between central government and every local authority to determine the national and local priorities for each area and they will be at the heart of public service delivery in every area of the country. These are not a centralising measure. Quite the opposite. They are a genuine central local negotiation which allows and indeed requires local authority leadership to have influence and direction over public sector agencies, government agencies in their locality. And combined with the new statutory framework, and the power, uh, or duty rather, to cooperate that the Local Government Bill places upon those many local public sector agencies. They represent a radical shift in power from central uh, to local. The outcome of local area agreement is a deal that hands over responsibility and does free up funding from local government and the local partners to take the action that they decide is best for their area. And the local area agreement is, in my view, the most important change in public finance policy as regards to local government that there has been since the Second World War. It is that important. It's not known yet, as the Comprehensive Spending Review is still going on, but my guess is that by the end of the 2008-11 period, around £5 billion pounds of public expenditure will be directed through local area agreements. The 35 mandatory targets that will be placed within those LAAs are bespoke to the local authority area. Michael, you talk about managing differences between areas rather than postcode lottery, and you're right, and I agree, and that is the mechanism by which we believe we will address that point. Now, as has already been said, much of the media interest in the report has focused, of course, on what might happen to council tax. And this is an issue that has been subject to a huge amount of scaremongering, of misinformation uh, in the media uh, debate. And it is sad, as Sir Sandy, as Lord Sandy uh, said, and I echo his remarks, that the so-called debate around this has focused attention on these particular areas. How it contributes to helping to deliver the local services needed by the communities that local government serves is the important question. And it is right, as the report says, that there is no magic bullet or simple solution. And the government will take a deve developmental approach to reform. The important message that comes out of the report is that council tax is not broken. It is not the council tax that causes the raging controversy. It is the increase in council tax that does so, as would be the case for any other tax uh, that is levied by central or local government. And of course, no tax will ever win a popularity contest. Of course it won't. But as I say, it is not the tax itself, and the analysis of Sir Michael's report backs it up, which causes the problem. The clear benefits of council tax are there to be seen firstly in the collection rates. A 96.8% collection rate is an important provider of stable public finances and the other taxes that we have in this country uh, would envy such a high collection rate. And councils are to be congratulated because that represents an ever increasing figure and you are, councils are to be congratulated on that. And it is not the case that people are imprisoned for the inability to pay the council tax. It is not possible under law in this country to be sent to jail for being unable to pay the council tax, only to be sent to prison for being willfully uh, refusing to pay it. And the number of people who have been prosecuted for non-payment is at the lowest it has been since the tax was introduced. Not to say, of course, that there aren't problems with it. And the government has taken decisive action to prevent unacceptable rises in council tax. That policy is, of course, amongst the most controversial that the report addresses. We have provided 
10 years of increased funding to local authorities. And we can debate as to uh, the comparative figures, but local government has had more resources. And we are ensuring, although not enough, that low-income households receive council tax benefit. 15% of all council tax is paid for through the council tax benefit system. But Sir Michael is saying some very important things. First, that it should not be called a benefit. I agree. Council tax is an amalgamation of a personal tax and a property tax. And the very phrase benefit is part of the problem. Secondly, that we should look at the thresholds and the mechanisms for paying that, with the desirability of automaticity being in the system. That is clearly something that the government will, needs to uh, and will address. Sir Michael's report points out that there is, in fact, a close correlation between council tax band and income, although it also points out that it is not uh, a straight line. It is not uh, exactly parallel. Now, while I appreciate the arguments in favour of revaluation, and I appreciate the way in which you have framed the argument and put the ball in the air in the right place uh, to be hit, if I may put it that way. Let me just uh, look at some of the evidence in the inquiry. The evidence does show that revaluation would not on its own have a significant impact on the fairness of council tax relative to income. It would, however, in my view, cause disruption for families and individuals. But the public debate about this, and where Sir Michael's report will help enormously, the public debate is based on a false premise. Council tax is not based on the value of your home. It is based on the relative value of your home. And yet millions of people believe that if their, the value of their home is, has risen, as most have, then a revaluation would automatically lead to an increase in the council tax. That was not the reason in Wales, which was a revenue neutral revaluation. It was not the reason why council taxes went up. So the government will therefore stand by its commitment not to revalue during the lifetime of this parliament. Indeed, with the forthcoming three-year settlement for local government to run from 2008 to 11, which councils themselves said overwhelmingly in the response to the consultation on the funding formula last year was an essential prerequisite to stability, to the ability to pass on stable taxes to the public and in their ability to use the local area agreement with their partners to focus on the delivery of services and the place shaping role rather than on the annual uh, what I've described in the past as uh, being faced with government debate over the RSG. That stability that the three year settlement brings us should not be subject to the turbulence that such a policy of revaluation at this point would cause. So even at this point, there would need to be clear benefits. Similarly, and for the same reasons, we have no plans at present to change the current banding structure of council tax, although I note that since the publication of your report uh, already, that the debate on both ends of the band have started to rage, with some newspapers threatening uh, hell and brimstone if we were to have a higher band, and other newspapers demanding that we have a lower band in order to address uh, the needs of the less well-off. So your report has already succeeded in pushing this into the fore. We take seriously, of course, the need to protect those who are least able to afford the council tax, and that is why we are concerned about the 40% of those pensioners entitled to CTB that's up to 2.1 million people who are missing out. And that's why we are already working hard following the report to make sure that this take-up rate is improved. And Sir Michael made a very important point in this regard. He said, and the report says, that councils on their own have been unable to increase those take-up rates. I'm also told that I should trust local councils. 
My answer is that we work in partnership to improve the situation, and this is one area where clearly we need urgently to address. Local councils, of course, are the administrators of council tax benefit and so have a crucial role to play in encouraging this take-up, and we will be working with local government to do exactly that. There is much good practice already uh, in existence. The government, in regards to CTB, is already playing its part by reducing the bureaucracy in the process. Just one example with the Department of Work and Pensions, uh, where they are taking steps to ensure that pensioners can access not just council tax, but housing benefit through just one phone call when they apply for their pension credit. It must be more accessible, and I believe that will address directly, as the report says, uh, the fairness issue that causes the controversy, or the unfairness issue, I should say. Now, whilst the government agrees that council tax is not broken and does have benefits, we recognise, of course, that it faces huge challenges. It does provoke strong feelings uh, from the people's perception that it is unfair. And since it has no automatic link to increased prosperity, it has to be increased every year in order to provide sufficient revenue. And the government will therefore consider the analysis in the report on other potential options for raising finance in local areas in the medium to long term. I'm pleased that Sir Michael has emphasised that the context for reform of local taxation in England is very different from that in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland never had the poll tax or the council tax and therefore to say that it has been used currently as a test bed or an experiment uh, for England is wholly false and your report has nailed that lie. Indeed in Northern Ireland they are moving from a rental based valuation process to a capital based valuation process and in that respect it is Northern Ireland that is following uh, England, Wales uh, and Scotland. So. I think I can put that one, or I hope I can put that one uh, to bed. A tax based on a points value system is emphatically not the right way to move forward in England and Wales, in case the Welsh press are here. The comprehensive spending review is the context in which we will take stock of local authority pressures and the opportunities for mitigating and managing them. We have already a robust analysis with the Local Government Association, and I thank them for that, on the pressures on councils, in particular social care, waste, as has been mentioned, and of course pay, although there are other issues as well. What we're also looking at is what is really affordable and what steps councils and local partners should be expected to take themselves to offset new pressures, how they can make better use of flexibilities and freedoms to provide services tailored to the individual needs. The idea that resources will continue to be available, uh, increases in resources will continue to be available to local councils at levels commensurate with the last 10 years, I think is understood not to be the case. But the efficient and effective use of public resources by councils with their partners, with the public expenditure that local uh, and national government agencies provide in local areas is the way in which we will address these pressures and these issues. Example I've mentioned, of course, of pay. The biggest problem, the biggest item in my entry and yours, is the issue of equal pay for equal value. Not much reported by the press, but it is hugely important that we have an accountable pay negotiation structure uh, in this country. It is hugely important that we do so. Around 80% of expenditure, if you include the contracted sector, in local councils is spent on pay. And as partnership working and local area agreements roll out, the differentials between the different sectors will be thrown into greater spotlights. And we need to address those issues now, not after the event when we've got the problem. So the comprehensive spending review is doing some radical reconsideration of what is already in existing baseline and how services are delivered. Indeed, to give you reassurance, the strongest ally in Whitehall of the Department for Communities and Local Government is Her Majesty's Treasury. 
Because just as we see the place shaping role for local councils, they see also the financial efficiency benefits and effectiveness of service delivery that comes through better joining up. Turning quickly to business rates, I agree with Sir Michael's conclusion that business rates are a successful and stable property tax and that there is no case at this time for changing the current RPI cap, cap on annual increases in the national rate of tax. However, we accept your case, Sir Michael, for improving some aspects of the regime. In particular, the report has endorsed Kate Barker's conclusion that the current system of providing relief for empty property from business rates is not justified and should be amended. UK office rents are among the highest in the world, and yet more than 10% of property in, say, the City of London is currently empty, and we believe that reductions in this relief could help encourage more efficient use and a readier supply of property and lower rents for businesses who rent their accommodation. And at the same time, it would remove unjustified imbalances and distortions. We will therefore legislate as soon as possible to remove the current relief for most types of empty property after a period of three months or six months in the case of industrial property and warehouses. In doing so, we will, of course, pay careful attention to the implications of such changes for classes of empty property which receive special treatment within the current system. We will, for example, exempt empty property held by charities from a business rates charge. We will also, as the report proposes, consider the merits of extending rates to include derelict and vacant previously developed land and assess other reliefs and exemptions to business rates. However, we have no plans at the moment to change the existing relief given to charities, which will not form, form part of this assessment. We agree also that while business rates are a successful and stable tax, a local supplementary rate could provide an opportunity for local communities to raise additional resources, which they could then invest in their community and use to strengthen their local uh, economies. Of course, any supplementary rate would need to be subject to wide acceptability amongst ratepayers, and I note the reaction immediately of the CBI to the proposals. We will consider the best way forward in this regard. Some bodies, including the LGA, have made the case for an independent commission, and the report rightly emphasises the importance of transparency and clarity in funding. And you are absolutely right, Sir Michael, that people need to understand where their money goes and what they get for it. And we will look carefully at what you have said about accountability and transparency. I don't agree, for the reasons that have been given, that an independent commission would be the right uh, approach. The difficult decisions involved need to be made on funding choices, on funding choices and levels. And we are firmly of the view that these should be made directly by directly elected politicians, accountable through Parliament to the taxpayer. However, we will build on the existing work by the Audit Commission by examining the possibility of providing greater clarity and transparency to local people about the levels of public funding going into their local area, the local area agreement and the local spending plans being the vehicle for that. Now, there are many things uh, in the report that I've not been able to cover. I want to conclude by reassuring people, or assuring you if you're a sceptic, that the direction of travel of Sir Michael's report is welcomed very much by central government. We do see it as a parallel report to the local government white paper. We do believe that local government is fit for purpose to move into the new era, which will be heralded by not just new financial arrangements, but a new statutory framework uh, for local government. And as we begin from April the 1st next year, the three-year period of predictable and stable funding, I look forward to working with you in implementing what is the most exciting challenge for local government for a generation. And I thank Sir Michael for your support in that process. Thank you very much indeed.